on air. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome our students from the Catholic University of Paraná, Campus Maringá. It's a great joy and honor to be able to welcome you on this day, October the 13th. We will start a new path on our criminology course of the PUC Maringá. We're going to work today on a lecture that without any exaggeration is going to be a historical lecture by Professor Ivor Foxy. I had the honor and joy of meeting him in 2018 in Porto Alegre during a course in which he and a few colleagues from uh, Norway gave in uh, the Police Academy of Rio Grande do Sul. At the time I was doing a postdoc with Professor uh, Stain, and it was an honor to get to know Professor Ever and also realize uh, and get to know other realities. I'm sure everyone is going to enjoy a lot today. So I'd like to greet the members of our virtual panel who are here in this important event, Colonel Luis Rodrigo Larson Castings, who works a lot in the Association of Officers here in Paraná. And for sure, he has been doing that for a while. He has been a partner of us in this course. And we're sure that everybody is going to be included in the construction of this course, not just in terms of learning, but also teaching us about uh, public uh, security models. It's an honor to count on you, Colonel, and I'd like to thank you a lot to uh, for your participation and, and being so quick to respond to our invitation. I'd also like to greet my dear friend, Professor Rafael Altoer, who is the director of the Paraná School for Judges faculty, and he has been very much devoted to managing such an important course in these times of a pandemic, very challenging times for all of us. So Rafael, I have no words uh, to thank you for your partnership. And Rafael is a reference in the criminal uh, arena here in Brazil. And everybody who talks about criminal uh, investigations in Brazil needs to read him. I'd also like to greet my dear friend, Everton Caldeira, who is once again working with us, representing uh, the Bar Association of Maringá. I'd also like to greet him. On behalf of Professor Claudio Piraja, Dr. Everton is one of the most famous criminal uh, attorneys that we have here in the metropolitan area of Maringá. He's also the coordinator of the Criminal Advocacy Commission, who's very uh, much active in uh, our Bar Association of Maringá. And Dr. Everton would also like to thank you very much for your possibility of being here with us today. I also need to say, last but not least, uh, the presence of our dear Professor Ivar Foxing. I apologize for any uh, delays in communication, but uh, it's a historical moment for us, Professor Ivar, to be here in the Catholic University of Paraná to welcome him. And I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from you, especially about the model of a country that is so inspiring, like Norway. A great deal of my theoretical reference in terms of criminology comes from Norway. And Professor Matisse and Professor Luis Kriesen, I, I had the honor to translate Limits of Pain, uh, the work by Professor Luis Kriesen in 2016. And it was one of the books that changed my life. I can say that it's before and after. In terms of perspective for the criminology and Professor Luis Kriesen in his infinite generosity, gave me this honor 
of translating his work. And one of his most important books for me, in my view, uh, into Portuguese. So please be sure that today, Professor, uh, it's a historical day, not only for people who are watching us, but also for this humble professor speaking to you right now, because uh, we're sure that this tradition of Norway is a tradition that needs to be studied, needs to be analyzed, needs to be looked into, looked at with a lot of care. Uh, of course, always considering the different, different contexts of Brazil and Norway, but we can always learn from uh, experiences from abroad and know that we can incorporate things into our reality. So Professor Ivar, welcome once again, and thank you very much for your availability, for your generosity of being here with us. And to the audience, well, I can just tell you, enjoy. It's a historical moment, it's a very important moment. I'm sure that you're going to enjoy. Professor Ivar, without any further ado, I'm going to pass the floor to you and then our colleagues, both Colonel and Professor Everton and Professor Rafael, uh, you can also have a little time to ask questions at the end of Dr. Ivers' lecture. And also the audience will also be able to ask questions in the end. So Professor Ivers, once again, thank you very much. And you have the floor now. Well, thanks a lot, Professor Gustavo. It's, it's truly an honor for me to be able to speak to such a great group of people. And uh, just hearing your enthusiasm about the great work of Professor Nils uh, Christie and Thomas Matheson, uh, which I also hold very high, it makes me um, smile. And uh, I missed. Uh, Niels Christie, even more, uh, as you, I'm sure you know, he passed away a couple of years ago. He was very fit, but he had a bike accident and, uh, and died on his way to work. He worked all his life and uh, made so much great changes in the Norwegian culture. And hope, I'm glad to hear that he also have had an impact outside of the Norwegian uh, territory. Um, can you see my presentation now? The making of an expert detective. Good. Um, my lecture today will be about something that you should think everybody knows. Thinking and deciding in criminal investigations. How do you think when you do criminal investigations? And how do you make up your mind? How do you decide when you go along and when you conclude? Criminal investigation is probably one of the most popular things you see both in books and TV series. I guess all of us have some kind of favorite fictional detective series. Uh, there are ladies, there are men, they are young, they are macho, they are wise or old, they comes in many characters. But when you think about it, how does a good detective think? Is that clear to you? Well, I can tell you it was not clear to me when I started to go into this field of research. Before I go further, I will just pass a, a quick presentation about <clears throat> myself. Oh, let me see here. Um, I'm still a serving police officer. Um, I think that is important. If you want to do research on any topic, especially this, you need to have it also in your fingers. It's like, imagine if you want to do research on medicine or brain surgery. It be, would be really strange if you never did medicine or never did brain surgery. So I try to stay active in criminal investigations alongside being a researcher 
and trying to understand and describe this profession and hopefully also develop it. I have been lucky enough to do a master in forensic and legal psychology in England and my PhD in investigative psychology and decision making I did in Sweden in University of Gothenburg with a great team uh, there headed by Professor uh, Per Anders Granhag and Karl Ask. I've also contributed to a number of books. So if you Google my name, uh, you will hopefully find uh, quite a lot of material written in English, both in articles and book chapters and books that hopefully can be inspiring. And some of them are about what we will talk uh, around today. Um, one of my challenges when I was going to do some research is that can be really test if you are a good detective. You know, let's say you want to recruit someone. You, of course, you would like to find out, is this a good candidate or is it not so good candidate? How will you test that? Is it by looking at his grades from the high school or, or is it by talking to him or her? At least I can tell you in my country, Norway, we didn't have such a test. If you were good enough for becoming a police officer and had an interest for criminal investigation, that was uh, all you needed to have. And if you wanted to get a promotion, it was necessary that you kept your boss happy. Hmm? But there were no tests, no objective way of saying that according to this test, Ivar is a good detective, but you can be better in this and these areas. I'm quite sure that in Brazil and other countries, there are no tests, at least that I have not heard about, that can test this. So this was one of my goals when I started my research to see, is it possible to compare and test detectives, how they think, not only in Norway, but also if you compare a detective in Norway to someone in another country. So you can have a world championship of how to think like a detective. It's an ambitious plan, but I thought it could be possible because I have been fortunate enough in my work, I have been working with organized crime, homicides, and, and very serious crimes in many, many places in the world. And if I travel to Brazil or to the US or to England or to France or to China or to Australia, when I meet someone who have the same profession as myself and I work with them on a case, you quite quickly find out whether this person is skilled or not. You can feel it. You can see it. You can, you get that feeling of, yes, we are part of the same profession. So I know there is something here that links us apart, but what is that? And I think if you are a good detective in Brazil, you probably are also a good uh, detective in London or in New York or in Norway. And I think the, also the way the world is developing, we are getting more and more interconnected, more and more globally fighting the same problems. So we need that connection. We need to know that the one in the other end of your cooperation is a competent 
on a certain level and think more or less the same as you do. This is compatibility. This is absolutely necessary to keep a high standard on a global level. Well, <clears throat> when I was doing my research, I actually did a comparative study between detectives from London, from Scotland Yard, and detectives from Oslo, Norway. And I took a sample of 30 homicide detectives in each country that I gave two written tasks about girls missing. You know, missing persons cases are sometimes the most difficult cases to investigate for the police. And why? Well, as you know, missing persons can be the worst thinkable crime. It can be a sexual homicide, a part of a serial uh, murder, for instance, but it can also be almost nothing. It can be just someone who is lost or just don't, don't want to talk to their parents right now who have just sitting in their basement, smoking pot. So it can be very serious and it can be nothing at all. And in between here, you have accidents, suicide, runaways, kidnaps, and serious illnesses. So that is the specter that you have to investigate all at the same time. So it's like, they are complex cases. So I agreed with the Scotland Yard on two cases that I described in cooperation with col uh, police officers in England and police officers in Norway, we had created these cases so that they were relevant, both in a British context and a Norway context. And then we created what you can think about as a gold standard. What is the optimal answer if you were supposed to investigate these crimes? And to be honest, when I was creating that gold standard, I was thinking, is this really possible? Maybe my whole PhD will be occupied with just finding the gold standard. But no, it, that went really quickly. Detectives from, from London and detectives from Oslo, Norway, agreed really quickly on what the standard should be. It was only one interaction and then we agreed. So that was kind of promising. Uh, <clears throat> so the purpose of doing this was, what does it really mean to be a good detective? Is it true what I have been feeling after like almost 30 years in the police that some detectives are better than others? And if so, why are they better? What is it that makes them better? Is there a better way of thinking for detectives? Can we say that there is an ultimate method, like a mantra or a dogma even? And if so, can this be tested and can it be compared? And finally, since we on the panel today have both judges and criminal uh, lawyers and high ranking police officers 
and researchers in law, how does this way of thinking relate to law? And how does it relate to prosecutions? And I can even add one more question. Is it so that it would be an advantage that we shared the way we evaluate evidence? That there is kind of a standard of how you think about the level of evidence, the weight of the evidence in the same way. That is some of the questions that I will rise in today's lecture. I will go straight to the results of my research. <clears throat> if you look here, this looks perhaps a bit cryptical, but if you see on the bottom here, you have here, can you see my arrow? This is a police officer on the streets of London. You know the guys with the, the big hats, what they call the bobbies? So he is not a detective, but he has been working there for a maximum two or three years. On my test, they scored down here. This is the test given to a Norwegian new police officer, straight out from the police college. Maximum two years of experience, they were able to score almost 50%. In England, somewhere between around 25. But look what happens when I gave the test to the Norwegian homicide detectives. The very experienced detectives here, they had 25 years of experience and they have a lower score than the new recruits. Around 38% on average. While in England, the detectives of Scotland Yard have almost 80% score and are much better than the recruit. This is quite disturbing if you are from Norway. At least if you are old, like me. <laughs> or you could say, in one way you could say, it's very promising for the new recruits. But it's not very optimistic when you look about how the detectives that work with homicides do it. And how can this be, this, uh, this is exactly what I was expecting, or I should be honest, I would not expect that the experts were not, were, were poorer than the novices, but I expected them to be poorer than in England. I expected them to be somewhere up here. I have done this test in many countries in the world and also in Brazil. Twenty-seven, that is the experienced detectives from what you call it, Policia Federal, something like that, in Sao Paulo. About one group around a size like 40, maybe. So you see they are, the red bars here are expert detectives, meaning that they have an experience that are more than 10 years as a detective. Norway scored 41, Brazil scored 27, Indonesia, 22. In England, 78. If you compare, 
England to Norway, you can actually see that the, the, the English detectives from Scotland Yard, they get a little bit better for every year they have been working. There is a, there is a significant positive correlation between how you think positively and how long you have been working. In Norway, it's a negative correlation. You think you're thinking more and more negatively the longer you work. How can this be explained? Well, at first, I was quite surprised by these findings. But if you think about it again, what do you think is the most important variable here? If you compare this to staying fit, let's say, how often do you go to the gym? So everything that you do not keep up to date will go down in quality. So if you don't train it, it will become less good over time. That is what you ex can expect. So England has much more training than Norway. And because of that, maybe they stay fitter in their brain. <clears throat> and this is related to a very, very interesting development that happened in England about 20 years ago. Where after a number of scandals in high profile criminal investigations around the country and also in London, they realized that our police are not good enough. They need a program for how to change the way they think about the evidence and to improve the way they do criminal investigation. And this was started out in 2001. And it's a bit humiliating for the police that someone in the government tell them that the police needs a clear and common understanding of the theory of criminal investigation. Can you imagine? Who could tell the, the Brazilian police that, hello, you, you, you need to change, you need understanding of this. Well, and they also need a more effective way of spreading good practice in criminal investigations. How can they share what it means to be good? I think that if someone told the Norwegian police this 20 years ago, they, it will be a lot of noise. Saying, how, who are you who think you can tell me how to do my job? But it was absolutely necessary. And this is now in England been going for 20 years. And it's a program called the PIP program, which is called <clears throat> Professionalizing Investigation Program. And these are the people on level three. PIP level three are the expert level. And that is the level that I compared to the Norwegian level with the same years of experience, but they have no mandatory training. And you saw the results. The, the results are appalling. So these people will not get their job until they have been recruited and gone through a very specific training program a very specific practical testing program, just like if you drive a car, someone will have the driving license, some will not. And every year they have to go through a re-examination 
to see if they are good enough. They have to document that they go through new learning and knew that how this relates to my job. And if you don't do it, you lose your driving license. Just like an airline pilot. It's not enough that you were a good pilot 20 years ago. You need to do it every year. Check out. If you go for a new plane, new checkout. So to put it short, it seems that these kind of programs have a very strong effect if you try to test how detectives think. I was not surprised by that, but I was surprised of how big the effect was. From a statistical point of view, the effect was almost going through the roof. Very, very strong. <clears throat> So it probably means that you have a method. You have a way of thinking. And uh, I know we have a panel with us today of uh, very uh, high level lawyers. Uh, but also we have an audience here of people who probably have some background from law uh also have an interest for law for criminal investigation can you tell me if you have an idea about what a good method is in law is there a way of thinking about evidence about how to prove anything that you know and can summarize relatively shortly. I have been asking these questions a lot, also here in Norway, even on the highest level in the country. And I have to say, there are not a lot of answers. What people tell me is that it depends on the case. You have to, you have to apply a different way of thinking to each and every case. There are no way that are similar for all cases. Well, that is Think about that, if that was football. It means you have different rules for all games. Then it's not football. You have to have the same, <laughs> the same rules for each game. And then, of course, each game will be different. But you need a fundamental way of playing football. Still, of course, each game will be different. But what is your method? Um, so this is a bit, I think it's almost intimidating when I ask lawyers these questions. Because lawyers think they can teach police officers how to think about evidence. And I'm not saying that lawyers cannot think about evidence. But I'm just asking, what is the method? And still, I have not seen it. There are, however, some very few professors who have expressed an idea about how to think about this. And I, one of them I found in Stockholm in Sweden. His name is called Christian Diesen. He is now Professor Emeritus at the University of Stockholm. And he said this, the method should derive from the evidence standard beyond reasonable doubt. 
You know, in criminal cases, that is what you need to be above if you want to have a conviction. So any doubt in the criminal investigation and its evidence evaluation should be presented as an alternative explanation. So what is the alternative hypothesis? Okay, if the guy is not guilty, what is it in the case that can make him innocent? Can the evidence be understood in an alternative way? If one such hypothesis is presented, then you cannot convict. So what he said is, if all reasonable alternative explanations can be excluded, then the case must be considered as proven. But if it's just one alternative explanation, still remains, there is doubt, and the accused should be acquitted. I hope all lawyers agree in this. <laughs> and this is also very much, I think, the role of the defense lawyer is to make sure that there are no remaining explanation that can help his client when it comes to evidence. Of course, there are other things when it comes to, you know, mental state and, and stuff like that, that can acquit you. But this is about how to understand the evidence in the case, which is about um, a little bit different. So this is a method which I th think <clears throat> probably could be used on all levels in the investigation, from the first police officer to the last judge, and including all the prosecutors. Um, I found something similar in one of the main books in England from two very high profile lawyers at the University of Oxford is saying this, the fact finder have to follow a mental procedure of progressive elimination of explanations consistent with innocence. So you have to look for, can this evidence still mean that you did not do it, but it looks like you do it, but it is actually different. And can this be ruled out? And if all that elimination is not done, we cannot convict, okay? Hopefully this is clear, but I can tell you, it's strangely rare to see this kind of methods in law. And I would like to challenge the lawyers um, present today if they can have seen this before, and if they feel that this is a very, was a really clear method before I started my lecture. Um, hopefully, most of you who have this as a handicraft agree that optimally, this is the way you should think. As a detective, but also as a prosecutor or as a judge. This is, of course, the theory. But think about this guy. You see on the left here, we have 
a profile picture of a guy called Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, I'm, I'm sure you have heard about him, he is the most famous fictional detective in the world, based on novels written around 1890 and until 1890, 1990, something like that, 1890, 1891, 1892, three, four, five, by the um, famous author, uh, <clears throat> Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was not a lawyer. Do you know his profession? He was a medical doctor. And think about it, this way of thinking that I have been through is also very much true for medicine. If you want to find out if something is wrong with the patient, you need to have a diagnostic process that have all the explanations up there and can rule out the other ones until you are left with one. Then you can give the treatment. And what did Arthur Conan Doyle say about the method? He said this. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So he says very much the same as the lawyers, both the Swedish lawyer and the British lawyers. It's a process of elimination. What have you tested and what are you left with? And I think it's quite interesting that this phrase here has been around for 130 years. And it still can't be found in any detective handbook. I, I never learned this when I did, when I did my graduation from the Norwegian police 30 years ago, no one told me how to think. They were just talking about all their cases. Last year we had this case, the year before they had this case. And that's what detectives do. When they come and teach you how to think, they talk about the case they once had on their own. There is no method, there is just a lot of cases. And I'm not saying that these cases are not important because they are. The cases can learn you a lot, but it will learn you more if they were put into a method. How can they explain a method? So I'm, I'm a bit, <clears throat> sad that I didn't learn this a long time ago. Most importantly, since you also mentioned then um, in the beginning here, Professor Gustavo, about the Norwegian criminology professor Nils Christie. He had a big heart for the victims of crime, but also for suspects that became victims of their own crime, but also for crimes they did not commit. Uh, he asked fundamental questions about how we govern our criminal justice systems. And these ways of thinking that I have now presented for you, in my view, would strengthen the way of thinking. Because we are talking about an elimination process, not a confirmation process. 
So it's almost like Karl Popper, if you have heard about Karl Popper, the famous uh, scientific philosopher, philosopher who say that the only way to get the confirmation is by repeated attempts of falsification. A direct confirmation can simply be correlation and isn't very strong evidence. And one of the reasons is that you don't know what other tests you could have done that could prove other way. It's called the inductive problem. Because you can't test what you don't know. It's not available to you. So <clears throat> elimination is a much stronger method than confirmation. So it will also strengthen the right of the innocent and strength, strengthen the quality of the criminal justice system. If this was not just something that happened when the police, the prosecutor and the judge had a good day, it happened every day. I'm not saying that this is not happening, but I don't, I think it's a bit random. On a good day, a detective will think like this, but not always. So objectivity, that is something most police officers hope that comes with the badge, with the responsibility and the training. Well, of course it doesn't. We are still just human beings with a lot of very biased way of thinking. The way you look, your clothing, your race, your neighborhood, the situation will make us suspicious and sometimes leave you with having to prove your own innocence. And they will not take you serious because they think from the outset that you are guilty just by your looks. That's the way we people think. We are very quick to make judgments. And if we first have made one, it's really hard to let it go. And even harder, if you already have arrested someone or already have told the police uh, maybe uh, told the, the media that we have, the, I think we have a suspect. Then you will have a strong tendency. And it's not because you are a bad person. <laughs> it's just because you are a human being. You will have a strong tendency to support your first idea. So, we have to rethink this, that police officers are no better thinkers than any other. We are simply humans who need a method and need someone to correct that method. Normally that is your boss and he will help you. And sometimes it's the uh, lawyer the defense lawyer, and sometimes, finally, it is the judge who simply tells the if he think you are correct or not, if he agrees or not. So we have systems here to help you keep this objectivity, and that is the system. But we have to understand that this is not something that some of us are born with. It's not something that comes with the uniform. It can, the uniform can even make it worse. So it is the sum of your knowledge 
and how this knowledge is put into an awareness when you come into a system, in a situation. And you have to have the skills to do it in that difficult situation. And to help you with that, you need a method. And to do that method, you need a tool. And on top of that, you need a system that put all this into the right places at the right time and keeps it going and developing. And the basic one is on individual. The knowledge in, is inside your head. And the highest here, the systems are on a systemic level. So the systemic level should make sure that all the other things here are in place and that they work in harmony. And this is what I think I found when I compared England with Norway in my research. They have a much better systemic level that was able to drip down and was testable on the individual level. They had the product was to be found on the each and every officer. And it was a stable, high quality in the way they were thinking. Because they have all this. They have a system, they have tools, they have methods, that have, they have skills and awareness and knowledge. And without any of them, you will have a problem. I don't know the Brazilian police very well. I have met many officers uh, during my one trip there, and I think they were highly professional in the way that I met them. I instantly feel that these were people who were honestly trying to do the best possible job. On the other hand, I'm quite sure that you don't have a system like this. There are very few countries in the world who has. And I can say that, and maybe it sounds a bit brave to say that, but I am, I am traveling the world doing this. Uh, I think there are very few countries who have a system like that. And we have to realize that without them, we are still struggling with the basic human errors in the criminal justice system. And remember, these errors will be the same for the prosecutor. They will be the same for the boss. <laughs> it will be the same for the judge even. And sometimes even for the defense lawyer. We have the same weaknesses because simply we are all human beings. So sometimes on a bad day, a, a, a problem can go all the way through the systems and no one will actually detect it. On a good day, and hopefully that's the, most of the good days, it will be detected early and corrected. So what we did in Norway, this is, I was thinking, there is no model for how to think. So we need a model that we can teach all our detectives from day one. So I tried to develop a model, which is called the six C's. And this is now in use in all, <clears throat> all the books and all the training of Norwegian police. And it kind of takes you through a process of thinking that is in line with the very wise words we have seen from the legal professor I just quoted about how to eliminate. And I also have, I will not go into detail with this, but I can share it so that this can be passed out later if you want to look at it in detail. But it's quite obvious 
that you need a way of thinking. You cannot just expect good thinking to come by itself. That is overly optimistic. So, and now you know that all detectives are trained in the same way, and now they can start working in harmony. And if someone seems to have a bad day, they can correct each other at the first early possible moment, even the first minute of the suspicion. They can start helping each other to connect the evidence, check the relevance of it, and see what are the possible constructs. And then how can we test them? How can we rule out, quick, as quickly as possible, rule out the ones who are not relevant? And what are we left with? And when you are left with someone, you will go to your boss and consult him, or you will go to the prosecutor, or in the end, you will go to the judge. <laughs> and he will see if there is something he thought that you forgot. And then you have to do it again. If there are more evidence, more time, or more resources, depending on the case, of course. Take a look at this. Okay, you have all seen this now. I'll take it away and ask you, how many triangles did you actually see? Just write it down, please. Only one number. If you, have, if, you have, if you have several ideas, you can write down all of them. Write it down. Because if, I, if you don't write it down, you will later to say that that's the one you think about anyway, what I say. That's also the way the human memory and mind works. We want to be right all the time. Although we know we are not. Well, if you have written it down, I can ask you what it was. But since we don't have interaction that closely here now, I will just tell you that typically people say three or six. Or sometimes they say nine or even 12. And some say, I don't know, which is not a bad answer. Probably the best, if, you, if, you, if that's the fact. And some say there were no triangles there at all. Let's have a look at it. You will see here, in retrospect, there are no triangles here. <clears throat> there are three incomplete circles. You know, it's, a, it's like a cake that someone has been taking one slice of. And then you have three incomplete triangles But all in all, these give a representation of triangles. But that is just in lack of a better word. Because we don't have names for these circles. And we don't have names for these incomplete triangles. And then I ask a leading question. How many triangles? And you plant an idea that he wouldn't ask that question if there were no triangles. But I did. And this is a very famous optical illusion that most people will associate with triangles 
although there are none. And think about this, if this was a criminal investigation, if you were alone on the decision, all of you who said something else, that there are no triangles, were wrong. And if you then made an arrest, you would have a strong, and you were leading this investigation, you would have a strong tendency to be sure. And you cannot go back because you cannot really see again what really happened. If you could that, it would be a really nice and easy job to be a police officer or to be a judge. What really happened is gone. It can never be reconstructed. So you will not be able to see the true picture one more time. It's just your idea about it that is alive. So wouldn't it be obvious that you should write down all the possible answers? So then you ask the rest of your team, what did you see? Well, I saw three triangles even, and I saw nine, I saw none, or I saw 12. Okay, write them down, all of them. Then you have your hypothesis, and now you start to test them. That's the point of an investigation, not to have confirming from the beginning what your suspicion was, it's in the name, investigate. Now you have to start the critical thinking, not just confirm your first idea. So hopefully you agree, it will be a better start if you have all these alternatives in the outset. And now we see, can we eliminate some of them? And what are we left with? That's how Norwegian detectives work today. They have shared knowledge and shared methods, just like you would in mathematics. If you want to solve this equation, you need a method. You cannot just do it. You need a way of thinking that will help you towards the right answer. This cannot leave, you can't just leave it up to anybody. You have to have an agreed understanding of how to find the right answer. And if you don't know it, you will have a hard time. I will promote the same way of thinking in criminal law. And then you need a method that is cross-checking. And the cross-checking is summarized here. Here you have all the different ways of thinking. What can this be? Triangle, three triangles, six triangles, 12, zero, or whatever. So either in a missing person case, either it can be a murder, it can be a kidnap, it can be an accident, sudden illness, suicide, or runaway. If a girl is missing, it can't be anything more. These are all the possible alternatives. There are no others. Of course, there are many ways of doing a murder, and there are many ways of doing a kidnap, and there are many ways of having an accident. But in general, these are the alternatives. So now you just have to dig out the evidence and see whether they are confirming and give them a green box, or if they are disconfirming by giving them a red box, or somewhere in between, you cannot say yellow. Strongly, strong evidence can have a strongly green color and weak evidence, not so strong. So, so you can be sure that each detective will think like this about some evidence in the case, but it cannot, it's not written down how can he transfer this to his boss? 
or to the prosecutor how you were thinking. But you can be sure that these ideas about the evidence, they come like this. And that's what forms your suspicion. So why not write it down? So that it's clear. What did you test? What was your evidence? And how did you evaluate the evidence? We do this all the time. And it goes quick. So this is another tool that Norwegian detectives have to use now. It's called an investigation plan, which is written down with all your hypothesis in it. And all hypotheses have to be tested towards all the evidence. And luckily, this is now not up to the detective himself to consider. The general of public prosecutions have decided that this has to be present in all criminal investigations. There are still ways, there are still needs for development because I think that this plan should be shared with the defense lawyer. It's still not, it's, it's still a, just a police document. And I cannot understand why we should keep this secret from the defense lawyer. On an early stage, you should present this, I think, to the defense lawyer so that he can help you with the things that you have not in your plan. If he likes to, if he likes. Of course, it shouldn't be compulsory that you have to assist your own investigation. <laughs> that's, an, uh, that's a clear human right not to. But if you want to, you should be allowed. So I think there are still uh, development that we need so that this can be an op open document shared also with the lawyer. What can you rule out? And the red boxes are the things that, if you see here, in general, you will see that murder is the alternative that has the strongest evidence. And you can see that like that. So it also helps you to keep an overview of where is this case going. And it's very easy to see from someone new coming in to evaluate the case. And the only thing they can do is to go in and check. What is it that you mean gives this a green box? And double check if they agree by reading that report. And do I think the same? So here you can compare evidence evaluations across the people who are meant to help each other to think correct, formally or informally. And of course, then, if we are agree that this can be a good way of thinking, there is no reason to start a missing case case without the hypothesis, because you know them before the case actually starts. What are the possible explanations of a missing girl? And this is, by the way, the, the, the case from Portugal, uh, the uh, Madeleine McCann. You have maybe heard about this girl from uh, England who disappeared on holiday with her two parents who were doctors, Madeline McCann. These are the possibilities. You can already have it in your plan before the investigation starts. What are the different sources to that knowledge and how do you check them? You can have it ready as a standard operational procedure. For every different case, you will have different hypotheses, and these hypotheses can actually be identified before the suspicion comes. It can give you a, a very different structure 
for how to start and you can much quicker go in and get that evidence and start evaluating it. And summarize it, as I said here, by what are the hypothesis, hypothesis? What is it that you need to test it? What are the ways you will test it? And what did you think about what you found? What do you think about the evidence? What is your evaluation? Here you are cross-checking information and you are documenting that you have been cross-checking and that you have been evaluating everything. And it, this allows then, as I said, for interaction between different levels and different competences. Do you think similar as the, as the people on the laboratory about this evidence or people who have another competence like yourself? <clears throat> Having said that, you also need systems that keeps all this information in place for you. Because when I started as a detective 30 years ago, the cases look like this. It was maybe like five or 10 witnesses. It was one crime scene, one victim and one suspect. It wasn't that much uh, paper. Today, you know, a case can be several gigabytes or 10th of gigabytes because you have so much more information. So there are, there are so much more that you need to test. So you need systems that can help you keep all this information and show that you actually have been testing it against all these different explanations. You cannot just leave all this to the human mind. It's too much information in a modern case for doing that. And you just cannot also push it into some kind of archive. You need to push it in, inside a matrix. What did you test against what explanation? And what is your evaluation of it? Um, afterwards, we can flip these systems into how can we build these skills? Because if you remember where I started my lecture saying, how do we know you are good? Well, you cannot be good if you have never done it before. So you need, like the airline pilots, you need simulation. So these ways of thinking put into a matrix can be, if you flip it into a simulator, these can help you to have detective simulations that you go into a, almost a 3D environment and you can teach detectives how to think even before they become a detective. Just like we do with airplane pilots. I have to say, we don't do this in Norway. We don't have these simulators. And I think it's a bit unethical that we actually train our police officers on people. <laughs> we train them on our own citizens. And we know they don't have the experience You wouldn't train an airline pilot like that. He, you would know that he is capable before he actually has got his plane full of passengers. So that's why I think we also need to develop systems and simulators that can, where we can share tests 
of how to become proficient and good. But with the systems I've already gone through, I think that is possible. Because you have the basic structure of it. Just like we do when you want to have, uh, if you're going to have an armed officer. And this kind of training and how to think like detective have to be a little bit, perhaps every week, you train a little bit. It's just like if you want to play the guitar, you can't just train once when you were 20 and then think that you can do this all your life. You have to practice a little bit every week or at least every second week to keep it going. And if you want to be a very, very good guitar player, you have to train more and regularly to stay on top. And this is the change I think we need within the detective community around the world. And if you don't practice, well, how can you be good? So this is an old saying, I think from ancient Greece, you do not rise to the occasion, but you will sink to your level of training if you meet the difficult case. So my question is, how do you train to become a good detective? And by that, guys, I thank you for your attention and ask if there are any questions. And I say thanks for listening. Uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Iver, for your magnificent exposure. Uh, it was uh, amazing. Uh, I I'm sure all of our students uh, really, uh, uh, really appreciate it. They are uh, saying it uh, through, our, through the online transmission at the YouTube page. Yes, uh, I would like uh, Dr. River uh, now to uh, to, to uh, the the audience may may, may uh, formulate their questions through our YouTube page, but I, I would like uh, yes, uh, but I would like first uh, our uh, our special guest, uh, uh, Colonel Luis uh, Rodrigo, our our dear Rafael Altoé, and uh, also. Everton Caldera, our uh, criminal lawyer, uh, which is uh, represented our uh, lawyers council from Mar Maringa, uh, may may uh, have a word, a short word for uh, the lecture. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, some of you, uh, Coronel Rodrigo, Rafael, uh, or Everton, querem dizer algumas palavras, fiquem bem à vontade. Oh, perfeito. Eu peço licença aos demais é, membros da mesa. Hi. I'd like to clarify to our lecturer, our uh, investigator, Dr. Ivor, I'd like to talk about the Brazilian police model. Many times it's misunderstood all over the world, but we have a systemic structure of co compartmentalizing competencies. And many times this denotes a certain difficulty in the field of criminal investigation in the accountability of the authorship of the crime and the application of the justice as a whole. So, to have an idea that is different from what seems uh, to be the model adopted in Norway of a sole police and of a complete cycle in prevention and investigation of a crime and the production of evidence and the information of the pro the process uh, to 
the court so that the justice can apply the pen penalties. Here we have a few peculiarities of a Brazilian culture. So we have a federal police that we call it, and it's it has the original competence of preventing and uh, repressing crimes and drug trafficking and uh, arms and ammunition and also political and economic crimes and the responsibility of policing ports, airports, and in the Brazilian borders. The offenses, the crimes, are the competence of the federal justice, and they're sent to this specialized justice that we have, that we call federal justice, federal police. And we also have the police and justice of the state itself, of the organization of the state itself, situating those in the competence of the federal justice. And so we have a civilian police, which is in charge of helping the state justice uh, to produce evidence for the crimes for which it has competence, common crimes, involve uh, assets and crimes against life, and they're sent to uh, the common justice. And in addition to that, we have the military police, which is uh, uh, people who use uniforms and they're the most visible arm uh, and branch of the police of the state because it identifies itself by uh, the uniform and it works. Uh, 24 hours a day in all of the municipalities of the country. This military police, has, it has a competence of doing the policing and to prevent crime and collect evidence and help collect initial evidence, but it does not have the competence to formalize the evidence, because the formalization of the evidence, uh, this is for the state police, which is the civilian police, not the military police. And besides the military police, we also uh, it also has the competence of preserving the public order when it breaks, and it has a residual competence of ensuring the defense of the territory and jobs in the case of a uh, commotion in the country. In extreme cases of uh, declaration of war in which the military police uh, are the auxiliary force and also reserve of the armed forces and the Brazilian army. So this model many times uh, generates a uh, lack of understanding uh, because there's a lack of a perfect integration and sharing of information. In addition to these matters and the legal structure and criminal structure and of the responsibility of a criminal justice, because it's another police uh, that now only takes care of inmates. And of this security, we have other complex factors that would give rise to a very extensive course, which is the identification of the causes of this crime I'd just like to uh, explain these things to our uh, guest to say that the Brazilian uh, model is not typical. It's very different. It has 
no similarity in any other place. Maybe there's one of the difficulties to uh, classify the penal uh, occurrences. And uh, although the statistics are not very good in many countries, and Brazil is no different from that, there's a great number of crimes, most notably crimes with respect to assets that are not reported and registered because they are uh, the number is so high in the country and in a certain way it contributes to generate a disbelief in the system as a whole because they're not reported. So I'd say that all of the theories of the world and all of the experiences needed to be tested in Brazil. Thank you. Good morning. I'd also like to say a few words. First of all, congratulations, Professor Ivar. It was a brilliant lecture. We've certainly learned a lot from you. And Dr. Ivar, I think the dream in the legal realm in Brazil is for us to have a method that can be effectively applied in investigations. I can say as an attorney, uh, I usually work in the defense and I can say things from my view and my observation. First of all, uh, in Brazil, I understand that we still have a very punitive, uh, punitive model. And in this year we had an advance uh, with new laws that favor search for the truth. But even defending uh, the police here, uh, I have a father who was a military policeman and we have a state and government difficulty because there is lack of resources, poor remuneration, and that generates a work in the end that is many times, I'm not saying always, but many times it would be uh, less than ideal. I made a few notes here. What I observe in a few investigations, unfortunately, is that uh, contrary to what you, uh, you said, that was uh, the ideal to have a method uh, so that you can have the same uh, attitude in terms of all of the police. What we see here is that many times you have the suspect and in the investigation, what you look is to confirm that indeed uh, that person is guilty. And you bring that to the courts later on and you have uh, this faulty uh proceeding uh, an inquiry and in an answer that would be ideal, not just for the defense, but also the public ministry so that they would have a conviction. Uh, what we expect is that actually, Professor, this method and this uh, study of yours uh, that could arrive to our police one day so that we can have a respect to the presumption of innocence, which is a constitutional principle in our investigations. Uh, until a while back, the defense couldn't even, when a suspect was heard, uh, we couldn't even ask questions. Now we have a law that ensures the defense to ask a few questions uh, also by the accused. So uh, that's what I'd like to say. Thank you very much, Professor, and thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you, Everton. Thank you, Colonel Luis. Dr. Rafael told me by WhatsApp that he would not like uh, to ask questions at the time. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, very briefly, so I, I won't ask questions because we have a lot of questions uh, and that uh, only speaks of the wonderful lecture and we have readings uh, for this week. I'd just like to say thank you and, and to congratulate everyone involved and the university and Gustavo and all of the collaborators who contributed to this event and very specially to Dr. Ivar. Thank you for your knowledge shared today. It was revolutionary and I speak for myself in terms of knowledge. I already knew a few things uh, from Gustavo, but I did not have contact with specificities and details. So I'd just like to uh, say thank you and to talk to the students who are following us. 
uh, that you know you had a privilege to have this international event. So it's just uh, to say thanks, really. Uh, and we still have a lot of questions to go through. So thank you. Thank you, Rafael, for what you said. I don't know if Professor Ivra would like to say anything else uh, after uh, the talks here, uh, after you have, but if Dr. Ivra does not want to comment on anything, we have a few questions from the audience that I'd like to say. So Professor Ivra, you, you have the floor if you want to say a few words or not. Well, I, I just want to say that um, thanks for all the generous comments. And also <clears throat> to say that I, 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 I actually did know, I actually do know that the Brazilian system, when it comes to how you organize this archite complex. And, uh, but it's not unique. Uh, it's not unique to, um, to Brazil. There are many other countries who have a similar complex structure and it typically it's the latin speaking countries like you find it very much uh, especially there but even more broken down the system is and i think there are very good things about these systems i generally think also the way that you have organized it have its benefits uh, but the more broken down it is and the more specialized it is towards different responsibilities, the more important it is, I think, to have some general models and systems that runs through all this to keep it together. And I often, I, I didn't have training for the military police, sadly. I hope I once can, can come to you and, and, and join you. And perhaps we can even make some, um, good ideas together, I'm sure uh, we could. But in this for the state police, I heard a lot of frustration about the military police, because they, you will always point to someone else if you have a problem. <laughs> so I think that that level of frustration could be administered in a much more productive way if you had some shared tools that could be administered perhaps electronically in you could have all all officers today have a phone and in that there could be a system that helps you to evaluate your evidence and show how you were thinking about it just almost like your car today will remind you to put on your seatbelt. This phone today can remind you to think about these steps before you finalize your report. And so it, there are many ways that we could, so I think hopefully we can uh, find ways to make this available. And not only in books, but Interestingly, after I have done my research, these models are now to be found also in the handbook for British detectives. So they, they have now imported the Norwegian models into the British books, which I think, of course, shows the strength and the possibilities of cooperation. We can always empower each other and all of us including the the audience have ideas that sometimes can be really really valuable so we just need opportunities to find them and to give them nurture and and, and make them grow and share them between us so again Thanks a lot. And Gustavo, I'm looking forward if there are any comments. Um, and Sim, remember, I just want... obrigado, né? Especialmente por essa perspectiva, né? Sempre holística. Thank you very much, especially uh, about this perspective holistic of looking at the police and this perspective of uh, building more and more bridges 
and destroying walls uh, between the perspectives, and that's essential. And that's why I also chose you for this, so that we can have our discussion. We actually have two questions here, Professor Ivar. Uh, one from our dear Professor Luciana Caetano, and she asks, how has the investigation with the use of technology been, for example, with the use of drones in Norway? And how is the right to privacy in view of the evidence collected by this type of technology in your country? Um, when it comes to the use of drones, I could probably say that we don't use drones specifically for the collection of evidence, as far as I know. That is more used in to do surveillance and recognition before you go in and do a police operation. Uh, where you need to look before you plan how to uh, enter a building or a, 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 a place, or if you have a, a large crowd of people or an accident place, how to understand how to use your resources in the best possible way and to understand your problem. More in an operational internal intelligence gathering process. As far as I know, we don't use drones to we might use something that is similar. We use a 3D scanning of the crime scenes. You know, the, the lasers that, and we can also put them into drones so that they can do a 3D exact print inside and outside of a house or a crime scene. And that is regarded, if we do that in a criminal investigation, that is regarded as any other evidence, as a fingerprint or as a police interview, where it's clearly part of the case documents and available to defense lawyer and the courts, uh, like any other evidence. But the use of drones, uh, when it comes to privacy, I think does not relate very much to criminal investigation, but more to privacy legislation in general. And there you have, of course, EU legislation and Eurovision specific legislation saying that you cannot do surveillance of anybody without a very a specific reason that is argued in a specific law about why you can keep and gather this and then there are special regulations for how long you can keep it. And then it will have to be go in just like a mobile phone. How long can a um, tele provider store these data? That is regulated by the same laws. So the police cannot do this on any other way than if they were a tele provider. You can keep it for so and so long, and then you have to be deleted. I don't know if I really answered your question, but it's not my area of speciality, I have to say. Mm -hmm. That's okay, Professor, no problem. I think you answered it actually and now i'm going to ask uh, the last question uh, our student here lucas bernardo he asked uh, the question in english so i'll try not to spoil it with my pronunciation and so he asked 
how can we start the process of elimination of reasonable doubt? What's the first step? Is it something close to elimination of innocence rather than how to prove the guilt of someone? That's a very good question. But I think if you want to call it a criminal investigation, you have to start with the guilt. If, if you don't start with your suspicion, then it's not a criminal investigation. You have to start with what this, what criminal offense can this be? What is the suspicion that makes me think that this can be something criminal? Mm -hmm. That has to be the beginning. If, if, if you cannot say that, how can you start a criminal investigation? So that will have to be the beginning. Then, and that's what makes it difficult, because then that very easily can be their only idea. Hmm? That's what you can go into a confirmation process that you would just want to prove that everything, and you've only find evidence that confirm the criminal hypothesis. And you, you will not look for evidence that does not confirm it. The rest is not there. You don't even write it down. You don't look for it. So <clears throat> you have to start with that and say, OK, uh, we have a reason here to think there is something criminal going on. Then you have to ask yourself, OK, but what else could this be? Is it possible? that this could have happened without anything criminal happening or with some other criminal paragraph. What are the alternative explanations? Let me give an example. Someone who owns a shop, let's say is selling newspapers, tobacco, drinks, and a typical tobacco shopper. Eh? He calls the police and say, this morning I came to my shop and found that has, someone has broken into it and stolen all the tobacco and all the money, okay? So as a police officer, there you have a suspicion of crime, eh? a suspicion of a burglary. You have to start with that. That is the, the reason why you start an investigation. But what else can it be? Well, it can be a false report. Maybe this guy hasn't lost anything, but maybe he's got some kind of insurance. So he just wants a report saying that he had a burglary so he can go somewhere to claim some compensation. So then you have to check if it was, does he have an insurance? And if he doesn't have an insurance, there are no reasons for him to wrongly report a burglary. So that's your first second hypothesis. One burglary, two false report. Three, it can be just a theft. Maybe the guy forgot to lock his door. So someone didn't actually break in, but they just walked in, took the tobacco, took the money, and walked out again. Then it's just a theft. It's not a burglary. Then you have three hypotheses. Four, maybe they didn't steal anything. Maybe they were just breaking something. So maybe they just broke a window, but they didn't steal anything. Someone else did that. So then you have 
property damage, and a theft, and no burglary. So that are the that are the four hypotheses that I would think of in such a case that you have to check. But you have to start with the criminal one. And there might even be more that I can't think of on the moment, but I'm trying to illustrate the way I think. And we know that the human mind needs this to be written down. You cannot think about all these things at the same time. Modern screening of our brain show that we can actually just think about one thing at a time. That's a good thing because it gives us focus. But it's also a negative thing when you are there to find out how things relate to several things. We are just not made for that. So you have to write it down and then systematically go through, did you check all these alternatives? Starting with the criminal one and then thinking actively, can it be something else? Yeah, thanks a lot. Não, eu agradeço muito, né, professor Iver, por toda a generosidade. Thank you, professor Iver, for uh, your generosity in being here with us this morning. I'd also like to thank uh, Colonel Luis Rodrigo Lastings uh, for his availability and coming here to enrich our debate with such an important perspective from the military police. I'd also like to thank professor and our judge here in Maringá, Rafael Toé, a dear friend, for coming here. We also know how hard it is, especially in the, these times of a pandemic and uh, small children at home. Uh, it's hard to organize ourselves to be here. And al also Dr. Everton uh, Caldera, a great partner of our events. He's always here with us as well. I'd also like to say, Dr. Everton, that you contribute a lot uh, to everything that we do. Uh, and Finally, but not less important, I'd also like to thank our audience who's been with us uh, all of this time. And Professor Iver, I was uh, checking the page on YouTube, so I was uh, looking at two screens here, and we had between the two uh, live uh, links, we had more than 150 uh, simultaneous accesses. So uh, this proof of uh, the quality of your lecture and also of such an amazing lecturer that you are. We have learned a lot from you this morning. And so I'd like to say that the doors to our Catholic University of Paraná are always open to you. And we hope uh, to have you uh, in other opportunities, especially in presence, uh, right? Especially uh, in person. Uh, we still want to organize our event on the testimony of psychology and Rafael and Professor Ibarre, one of our great partners in the enthusiasm for uh, the psychology of uh, witnessing here in the north of Paraná. We hope to count on you in person so that we can uh, uh, have a, a hug and see each other uh, when this pandemic is finally over. So thank you very much, Professor. It was amazing. I have no words to, to thank you for your generosity in, in giving your lecture. I, I said thank you. And I, I have two things I want to say. I, I'm sure if I come to visit, there are things I can learn from you. Two, I want to thank the fantastic interpreter, which I think did a very good job. And I was, I'm very, very fortunate to have her working alongside with me today. So thanks a lot, all of you, and ha have a nice day. And um, despite Norway having a football team, my favorite football team is Brazil. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Have a nice day and hope to see you soon. And thanks a lot, Gustavo, for inviting me. It means a lot. Take care. Obrigado, professor Iver. Obrigado também, Carolina, pela... Thank you, Dr. Iver. Thank you, Carolina, for the wonderful translation, Impeccable Carolina. That was amazing. We were commenting. Uh, we said that we had never seen a translation like yours in an event like this. So thank you very much, Carolina. Thank you very much for the audience and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all of you. Thank you.